crack art historical A team to uh, uh, fight this one out. Uh, on my right, far right, we have Deborah Diamond, the uh, curator at the Freer Sackler in Washington, D.C., and the woman behind what was for me one of the most sh shatteringly brilliant exhibitions put on in recent times, certainly the greatest exhibition I've ever seen on the art of Rajasthan, which is her Garden and the Cosmos show, which went from, yeah, and clap, clap, exactly, everyone, well, which was a complete knockout. And um, even if there was no one else on this panel, it would be lovely just to have Deborah talking for an hour on that. But sadly, we have even more, uh, uh, sorry, as equally wonderful uh, <laughs> galaxy of stars here. Um, Glenn Lowry, to my immediate right, has got one of the most intriguing CVs of anyone in, in the art world. And he started off, I think, doing a PhD on Humayun's tomb, living in a little Basati in Nizamuddin, and now bestrides MoMA as the colossus of, of, of uh, modern art curators, um, which is a, a story also that could take an hour uh, and, uh, to itself just to go through that extraordinary transformation. But in his first avatar, was responsible for two, or I met, made a number of shows, but two particularly which I would have loved to have seen and adore the catalogues of, the Akbar show, which was the first showing in America of the whole story of the Emperor Akbar and the art associated with him. Uh, and then, what was it, Turks and... What was the Timur. Timur and the... And the, and the, the Princely Vision. The Princely Vision, which is one of the most beautiful, gorgeous exhibition catalogues ever produced with unbelievable high quality of, of, of reproductions. And it's, 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 it's a thing of wonder. But go to your libraries and, and get it out. To my immediate left, the great... Representing the home team here, I suppose, the great uh, Professor Bian Goswami, judged by many people to be the greatest art historian in India, the greatest art historian of India, uh, and uh, a great personal um, hero of mine. I've just written an unbelievably sycophantic article about him for the New York Review of Books, which he hasn't seen yet, but will be hugely embarrassed by when he does get to see it. And finally, to bring us up to the present, we have Desmond Lazaro, uh, who is both a practicing artist, pitchway artist, and miniature artist. Um, and among other things, was a, a taught my wife. So, <laughs> when you direct literary festivals, there comes a terrible period about Christmas time, about a month before, when suddenly you realise you have to write sort of 200 cues for uh, for all the sessions, and you've left it to the day before publication, and you haven't bought anybody presents, and the whole thing is going out of control. And I wrote very hurriedly on Christmas Eve a cue for this session. The idea was to get four brilliant people talking about painting in India. Uh, and I called it On the Miniature and wrote a little blag about it. Um, well, when we all met at lunch today, um, almost all of them said that they'd never used the word miniature, uh, that it was a, a, an Orientalist construct shoved on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, Indian art, which uh, Professor Goswami tells me has no word for the miniature uh, in any Indian language. So that's me putting my place even before uh, we start. Professor Goswami, maybe you could kick off by saying why you object to the word miniature. <laughs> why it was such a lousy idea for a session. You know, in a situation like this, one doesn't know where to begin or how to begin. But a couple of thoughts come to my mind as far as the beginnings of miniatures in India are concerned and what purpose did they serve. Ordinarily, I mean, it's up to my distinguished colleagues to define what a miniature is. But we date the beginning of miniature painting in India from the 11th century onwards. And the first illustrated manuscript which has survived goes back to the 11th century. At that time, no paper was available in India and manuscripts had to be written on palm leaves, which have a narrow and oblong kind of a format. And the first miniatures appeared in the Jain tradition. So in a certain sense, one can date the beginnings of miniature painting to the 11th century, even though very few objects have survived from that particular period. But it gives us a very interesting... 
Sure. <laughs> Just to, to look backwards from that point, does the miniature, the, the, the emerging miniature art of the 11th century have anything in common with the stuff we know about from ancient India, the, the wall paintings of Ajanta or so on? As far as I'm concerned, no. There, I mean, some elements of mural painting, Ajanta and so on survive, especially in the Eastern tradition, in the Pala tradition. But in the Western tradition, hardly anything of that is reflected, which is very interesting. Somebody at one point of time put forward the idea, the theory, that miniature paintings came in at a time when lives began to feel unsettled that murals belong to a period when things are stable and because of Islamic invasions and so on and so forth, things became very different and it was a preferred manner of doing things to paint on small objects like palm leaf manuscripts and so on so that they are transportable. You carry them with yourself wherever you go. And these are religious objects and obviously you people, people traveled with them and so on and so forth. So whether it has something to do with the stability of society at that particular time or something different which came in from outside, we do not quite know. But in Kalidasa, for example, we have references to portrait painting. People talk about people falling in love with uh, looking, gazing at, 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 at portraits. In, in, so there are literary references to the existence of, of portraiture and so on, in, which presumably on, on, what, on what materials would they be talking about? Um, portraiture is a very problematic issue in India. There are thousands, if not thousands, hundreds of references to early portraiture in India. But what portraiture meant is a very different thing from what portraiture came to mean or is understood by in the West. Um, however, may I just take a minute to establish something else or try and establish something else? When miniature painting started, as far as I'm concerned, somewhere it touched a basic nerve in the Indian mind. <coughs> and that is, there is a preference for doing something on a small scale, abbreviate things. And, you know, if you look at in the... Con in contrast to the literary tradition, yeah, where you have sprawling epics going yeah, out on no, a... No, not only that. I mean, so if you look at the sutric literature, which is very, very brief, very, very, you know, laconic. I mean, the famous sort of saying which grammarians have, ardhamatra lagavena, right? Putra, chakshu, manyate, vayakaranaha. That if you are able to save half a syllable, then it gives you the same delight as the birth of a son in your family. That is how the grammarians believe. So it becomes a value in itself, the miniaturization, the abbreviation of it all, and so on and so forth. I have a couple of examples, but I don't want to take up all the time. But uh, maybe I'll come back to it in, in a moment or so. Deborah, you, over lunch, you were saying that um, you banned the word miniature from the, from the Sackler. Perhaps you'd like to explain why it's, a, it's, it's not allowed. Right. I, I work for the Freer and Sackler Galleries, which together are the National Museum of Asian Art in the United States. So, certainly in the U.S. context, miniature painting has come to be, uh, I think, a term that diminishes a great art form. It just seems small, it seems minor. And um, because there was no Sanskritic or Hindi word for the term miniature, because many of the paintings that we formerly call miniature um, are actually quite large, um, say the size of the coffee table in front of William right now, the borders between small, intimate, handheld manuscript illustration and rather large paintings, whether it's the Kedar Kalpa pilgrimage series that uh, Dr. Goswami is publishing a book on next year uh, from the sort of circa 1820 period from the Pahari Hills, or whether it's these monumental manuscript folios from Jodhpur, they're not miniature. They're quite large, um, and they may use certain techniques and materials, but 
they so exceed that, and they're a different space for artists to work in, and they're viewed in different ways. One more example, of course, would be the uh, painting traditions that come out of Udaipur and Mewar. They range from very small handheld things to, to paintings that are the size of that screen. So just being quite doctrinaire and, and being a true lover of Indian art and want it, wanting global audiences to appreciate and understand this art form, we don't use the word miniature anymore. We just call it Indian painting. Glenn, you, you were talking about a possible alternative simply being illustrated manuscripts. Well, as a former curator at the Freer and Sackler, uh, where miniature wasn't banned, uh, but I'm happy to abide by the new regime, uh, I want to... Uh, I, I, I do think, because I don't see that small is uh, in any way dismissive. In fact, I think you can conceive of small as being beautiful, as something intense, intimate, and powerful. And to a large degree, uh, there is a vibrant and long tradition in Indian painting at a small scale. And I would even argue that at the scale of William's table, it is still relatively modest compared to a large wall mural. What interests me, actually, is how these paintings were used. And when one thinks of the term miniature, uh, to describe a kind of painting, small in scale, on paper, or paper-backed, that was made to be held in your hand and seen in a very intimate way, which is, to a large extent, a, a really continuous part of an Indian tradition that often is associated either with the formation of albums or illustrated manuscripts, it is an idea that I think has a lot of potency. That is, the small scale, finely crafted, intensely made image that unfolds sequentially. And for me, what, it, what I think about uh, a great deal, especially when uh, looking at the Mughal tradition, which is largely an illustrated manuscript tradition, is not so much the relationship of image to text, the way in which they relate to the story that's being told, but to the fact that these images are almost proto-cinematic, that they unfold in a sequential way that has a very powerful non-literary, non-verbal dimension to it. And I think it's that aspect that gives an elasticity to this idea. One of the highlights of your Akbar show was, the, uh, was indeed something that was very literary, the, the Hamza Nama, which is the beginning in, in, traditionally always said to be the, the beginning moment of, of Mughal art. Well, the Hamza Nama is one of those great epic stories, uh, both in terms of its uh, creation for Akbar, the young Mughal emperor, and, of course, the story itself, which is, you know, as, you know, a, it's the great little adventure story, especially if you're a boy, because Hamza goes uh, romping around, uh, doing strange and wonderful deeds. But what was fascinating about the Hamza Nama that was made for Akbar, who was allegedly illiterate, although I think that's exaggerating a great deal, was that the scale of these paintings, rather than being the traditional small-scale illustrated manuscript size, were enlarged to, back to William's table, to roughly the size of William's tabletop. And furthermore, uh, weren't meant to be read in any traditional way, but borrow the narrative uh, village storytelling aspect of being held up and talked to. And what's fascinating about that is that if you think about these large images that borrow the technique of small-scale painting, but blow it up to a much larger scale, and then are presented not so much to be read, but to be spoken to, you begin to see that cinematic dimension unfold. They literally are unpacked for the viewer, and the viewer presumably was the young Akbar, who was a teenager at the time. Uh, these and were this, is a, this is like a kind of pre-photography pre slideshow. I think that's exactly the way to think of it. It's, it's sort of pre-PowerPoint, uh, but not unlike a PowerPoint. It really was meant image to image, relatively rapidly told, and where there's a kind of elision 
from one image to the next that goes way beyond any literary reference embedded in the story. And um, Physical Swami, maybe you'd like to speak about the, what happened when Akbar commissioned this enormous corpus of, of illustrations. How, how many in all? How many pictures were there in the original commission? Yeah. All of 1,400 paintings. And so how did, how did the uh, Akbar go about producing an atelier to make that huge volume of material? What was the process? Yeah, the documentation is rather poor, but we have evidence of contemporaries. A small part of the Hamza Nama has been paid attention to. <laughs> the belief is, as Glenn said, I mean that the paintings were so large, they told a story, an epic kind of a story. And a man would sort of hold the painting in front of Akbar as he sat on a throne. The text was written at the back, and somebody would read the text, and the emperor would be looking at the painting. So understand the story. So it's a kind of a narrative of that particular nature. But may I just um, take a minute or two to dwell on the idea that with time, doing things on a very small scale became a value in itself. And painters vied with each other to do that. I'll give you three examples in brief. From the time of Humayun, as Glenn would know more than I would, there's a letter which has survived, written by Humayun to the ruler of Kashmir in Central Asia, in which he is, I'm sending you some objects with my compliments. And one of the objects he sent to him was that I'm sending you a grain of rice on which my painter has painted a polo game in progress. The stick of one of the polo players has fallen to the ground and another man from the edge of the ground is running to pick up that stick and hand it back to the rider. And in the background of that particular field, there is a double storied chamber on which some people are roasting a fowl on fire, all on a grain of rice. Second. Um, some time ago I was involved in an exhibition on the manuscript tradition in India and I was looking for manuscripts and suddenly from Odisha somebody brought a necklace of what looked like Rudraksh beads and I said is this a manuscript? Yes it is a manuscript and when I, it was explained to me that each Rudraksh bead had been split open, cut open in the middle, and in the center of that, there were three leaves from palm leaf on which the Gita Govinda was inscribed, and then like a button, it was pressed down. So a number of these beads made up the entire text of the Gita Govinda, anybody could wear and walk off with it, or something like that. Now, things of that nature. Now, these traditions, I mean, let me just take one moment. Nain Suk is a painter that I have been involved in writing about. Nain Suk painted a large number of pictures. Only about 100 of them have survived. One of the finest is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It shows a landscape, wild elephants being captured with the help of tame elephants. Three registers. In the bottom part, the wild elephants, and there are a number of people bustling around, throwing ropes and this, that, and this. In the middle distance... The water. Uh, the, a, there's a river running. Yeah, through, yeah no, there's, there's a lake behind a lake. that. A lake behind that. Behind that is a landscape of mountains, rolling hills, and so on. Now, I had seen that painting several times. I published it. And then with the aid of digital images, which I saw, I mean, I suddenly saw something which I had never seen with my naked eye. And that is, in beyond the lake, under a tree, the tiny little dot, and that was a monkey seated, right, completely, perfectly made, red face, a kind of a tail which is uh, moving like this and so on, and nobody could possibly have seen that monkey with the naked eye. So what was the painter doing? To my mind, he was challenging himself. Can I make something smaller than the one that I had made before? Or somebody had challenged him or something of that kind. So it becomes a value in itself to be able to do things on a very, very small scale with precision. 
right? And with an understanding of the form of things and so on and so forth. Glenn, the, the, something extraordinary happens during the construction of this Hamza Nama series that you have already in court some artists from Persia that come back with Humayun. But uh, in order to fulfill this commission, Akbar orders the training up of artists from Gujarat. Could you talk a little about that and what happened? Well, I think one of the great things that happens under the Mughals, and it actually probably would have happened even without Akbar, was this willingness to merge traditions, to create an environment that allowed artists trained in Iran in a very specific kind of manuscript Linear tradition. Linear flat. Linear flat, often transmitted generation after generation through copy books and other uh, means of reproduction, uh, but very sophisticated, very precise, uh, with artists who had also been trained to work on a relatively small scale, an Indian book tradition or manuscript tradition, but where the images were composed very differently. Uh, and Akbar being both very ambitious and in a rush, uh, he had, if he didn't have ADD, uh, he probably had something very similar to that, wanted things to happen quickly. So he created or commissioned or caused into being uh, an atelier where these uh, two uh, primarily uh, Persian-trained artists started to train uh, native Gujarati artists, uh, but others as well along the way, to paint in a similar modality, a similar way. Uh, and of course what starts to happen is the tight, finely composed, highly controlled aspects of uh, painting from Iran give way to a looser, more vibrant, uh, in times even more impulsive dimension of Indian painting, or traditional Indian painting up until then, and what you get is Mughal manuscript traditions, which also borrow from Europe. In other words, what's really interesting about this idea of small-scale Indian painting is its elasticity. It can absorb. I mean, you can look at Mughal painting as originating in Iran and being inflected by India, but I think it's even more interesting to see it as Indian absorbing Iranian traditions as well as European traditions. And a great deal of stuff coming, Deborah, from the Goa and the Portuguese and being taking an interest in these, these Christian religious images which suddenly find themselves being reproduced all over a, a Muslim Mughal court. I, yes, but I agree that there's absorption of everything from everywhere. And there because there are so many Christian images that are available in India at that moment. The Jesuits are there and quite interested in sharing their pictures with the Mughal court uh, for many reasons. Um, but I'm not sure that they're, they're totally foreign to the Mughals because they're Christian. Akbar, for example, you know, understands, he looks at Mary and Jesus through the lens of Islam, because they're already saints in the, in the Muslim tradition. So there are, say, stories from Saadi, for example, that come from Iran. And when they're illustrated in, in the, at the Mughal court, the imagery comes from, the imagery comes out of Christian manuscripts from Europe. The story comes straight out of, out of Iran. Desmond. Could you talk a little bit about materials? What, what are we using? Um, uh, what, what are Indian miniaturists painting with? Is there a specifically Indian body of, of, of materials which are being used to paint these miniatures? What are the pigments, for example? Yeah, um, can you hear me? One, coming back to that question of miniature, um, because it is largely used in the wrong context, what we actually mean by miniature painting is not small format of painting. What we're actually referring to is a very specific technique of painting, modality of painting, which involves using natural colors, dyes, and pigments. Brushes, um, made from squirrel's hair or mongoose, paper, which is all handmade, and, and then the pigments that go on to that, which are made from four different modalities. There's earth, mineral, chemical colors, which are precipitated, such as mu um, vermilion cinnabar, which is sulfur and mercury, and then obviously dyes. 
This is what makes up miniature painting, because it's actually a form and a technique of painting which then can be applied on any surface, whether it be wood, cloth, paper, wall, whatever. It's pretty much the same thing. All the, the things that we're talking about this evening and now, the one thread that keeps this to going is the actual technique. So from then to now, that technique hasn't changed. You can still find mineral colors in Jaipur. You can still find brushes. Sanganir, you can still find people who make the original paper. That's a kind of common denominator. The image may change, and what comes in, as you say, everything is absorbed, some things are thrown out, other things are brought in. And I think it's the methods and the materials which actually, to a large extent, keep it on that level. And there seems to be even a, quite a specific Indian way of sitting to paint a picture. Yeah, we go back to the table again, since it seems to be coming back into it. You, you don't sit at a table. The idea of a miniature painting, and I think this is what makes it interesting, not only for, for painters who practice, but also for the wider world, is that you're taking a piece of paper which is very small, and you take it into your physical space. When you look at most art, you're looking at outside. It's a projection. With miniature, what you do is that you take the thing into your personal space. Now remember, a lot of these portfolios were paintings that were made to be seen by one person at a time. They weren't made to be seen en masse. Paintings were not hung in the courts, and then people came to see them. They were handed out person to person. And this is a, a crucial point, because nine-tenths of, or maybe even 99% of the way that miniatures are received today is on the walls of museums, yeah. which is not how they were ever meant to be. Yeah, I mean, it, Eberhard Fischer and Goswamiji took the amazing step many years ago to present miniatures not on the wall, they placed them in cabinets that people could actually peer over the top of, because that's originally how they were meant to be seen. As an extension to that, originally the idea of just taking a paper into your physical space is a very different dynamic from looking at something outside. One is about imploding the world into your sacred space, which is there. The other one is externalizing that space and exploding it. Very different concepts and ways of working. As an artist, it gives you a lot more flexibility because suddenly you've got someone's attention. Most art today is vying for your attention. Miniatures don't do that. They get your attention because you pull them into yourself. It's a very different way of going about it. And, and you're sitting on the ground normally with, sitting with on an the album ground, propped on your it. knee. Yeah, yeah, and it's on the knee as you would with musicians. Traditions are not the different, exactly the same. Most militaries today work in that same way. Professor Goswami, in your magnificent two-volume catalogue, which I, um, I think is one of the great masterpieces of modern Indian art history, you have two rather wonderful essays about the ateliers, which the Mughals and the Rajput states were... were um, the, the way in which these, these ateliers were run and the very striking difference between the tone of the Mughal ateliers and those of the Rajput or Bihari states. Maybe you could say a little bit about that. What, are the, what, what is the, the process of production that, the, that is producing these, these great masterpieces? The processes are dramatically different of production. The Mughal ateliers were organized as workshops in which there is a master painter who controlled the production. Everyone who had to make a painting was assigned the task of making a painting and first to take it to the master painter, the Ustad, who would either pass it or say, no, 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 go back. This is not good enough or this is what is wrong with it and so on. Uh, and where, where is this happening? Sorry? Where is it happening? Where was it happening? At, at the workshop karhana attached to the imperial court. In, in the Red Fort or yeah, in, could in have Fatipur been, Sikri? Could have been Fatipur Sikri, could have been in Agra, whatever, wherever they were. Whereas in the Rajput tradition, whether Rajasthani or Pahadi, the production was within a family of artists. So it is a, the family of artists, a master painter, his two sons or four sons, and nephews and grandsons and so on, they would work in a tradition which is very different from that of the master painter at the court. And these people worked at home, and as far as we can judge, they would then take the object to the, to the ruler, the patron, whoever had commissioned them, to present them. So the, the dynamics are different, and the situation is quite, quite different one from the other. Now here within a family, a style had developed. 
And at that style, there could be minor variations. The path was never quite abandoned. But within that, there must have been discussion between father and son, brother and brother, and so on and so forth. But it was a much more intimate way of doing things rather than a star pupil relationship and such and so on. And, and also the difference in that, presumably, in the Mughal court, you had people drawn, some from Gujarat, some from Kashmir, some from presumably Delhi and Agra. Yeah. While in, in, in a family setup, it's just a, it's just a group of cousins or brothers and uncles. Yeah, and yeah that, that certainly is a, is a factor in the situation. But apart from production, it is the end of product. I mean, where, who is going to look at it, right? The emperor, his family, whoever it is. And the point that Glenn made and, and um, uh, Desmond is making is the dynamics of seeing are so vastly different. A painting, as it was, has been said, was not meant to be hung on the wall. These were little objects which are kept in a basta or something like this. A silken a basta? Bas basta would be a, a bundle of cloth. And they were tied up and put away in a shelf and taken out only from time to time to be savoured. But one person would be looking at a painting at a time. Do we and, have and any... Let me, uh, let me just finish. You held a painting, as, as Glenn said, at a distance of 12 to 14 inches from the, from the eyes at this particular angle, and you savored it. You read it like a book from top to bottom, left to right, right to left. And at that moment of seeing, you were able to shut the world out of your system. Your complete silence could have been built inside of you when you were looking at it. Nobody is breathing down your neck, nobody is discussing it, and so on. You are face a with one particular work of art. It's a very, very different way in which you would enjoy a miniature than you would, a, a, let us say, painting on a wall. You might add one, one, one uh, dimension to certainly the Mughal atelier, which I think is somewhat different from what was taking place in the Rajput courts, and that's this extraordinary degree of specialization. Uh, that the Mughal atelier, you have to think of it as a production line. It's not just master and a pupil. It's also people who are very good at landscapes and other people who know how to draw faces and other people who know how to do color. And these manuscripts are being produced in volume and at some speed. Uh, and, and even when they are of the most sort of high quality, luxurious level of production, there is a demand to get them done. And so the Mughal court specializes. It breaks apart a tradition in order to expedite that production, but also to allow those people who are particularly good at flowers to do their flowers, uh, people who are great at uh, painting birds to do birds. And that means that a, a, any one painting can be the product of several hands who are working on that image over a relatively short time while the first person starts in on the second painting, and then the second person might be deployed to the third picture. So there's a very complex internal network that's required to support this, as opposed to the more intimate and personal sense of what was taking place uh, under, under the Rajputs. And I think that produces a, a, a degree of difference. Uh, one thing I wanted to pick up on, for all of you, um, was Yes, the experience of viewing uh, illustrated manuscripts from the Mughal court or small Rajput paintings in Bastas. One thing that really gets lost when we hang paintings on the wall is the motility of the surface. Motility. Almost, motility, the movement inherent. Almost all of these pages were highly burnished, so shiny, um, and liberally adorned with gold. So when you turn the page of a manuscript, or you pick up a painting from Basoli, the gold flickers, the quality of the paint changes. And when you hang it on a wall, it's just utterly flat and doesn't move. So unless you, you know, get down and crouch on your knees, you lose you know, all of the surface color. A, a Jane Kalpasutra manuscript from the 16th century hanging on the wall is quite inert. If you pick it up, it flickers, it flashes. So there is this great movement. And for me, that's one of the things that gets lost on the wall. Desmond, go back to producing these things. Um, Deborah mentioned burnishing. Could you just take us quickly through the process of actually 
preparing a piece of paper? What do you, how do you start to paint a miniature? What's the process? I should have brought some slides. Um, it's very simple. I guess you, you have the handmade paper. You have brushes. Closer. Closer. You have the handmade paper. You have the handmade brushes. The first thing will be, obviously, there's an idea. Now, the idea will come from a patron. It may come from a temple. Although artists also worked independently and took the work to the atelier, to the court afterwards. Um, there would be the initial sketch. The sketch was normally done with either charcoal, and then later on it was, it, the, basically you do an outline of something. And charcoal sticks are quite thick, and they can be quite messy at the same time. What's then on top of that is a very fine line using the miniature brush to what's called setting the line. Once the line is set, that means then you end with a piece of paper with a very clear line on it. In fact, the, one of the origins of the word in Persian, minai, comes from that. It means the actual original painting that was done on overglazed painting. It was a technical term where the idea of miniature came from. So you have this paper, you have this line that goes with the paper. On top of that, you then put fields of color. Now in miniature, we have about 10 basic colors. Um, the palette is, doesn't go beyond that really. Those are the flat colors, they're stone colors mainly. We call them stone because they're mineral based. They're placed onto the actual color field. So for instance, uh, if there's a portrait of a head and a background, the background will be one color, the head's another, and the hair would be another color. So from many complex variations of color, you break it down into a very simple field of color. Now what that, what that means for the artist, very simply, they can do one thing. You can look at a painting very quickly and establish where it's going right or wrong. You don't go through the whole process of finishing it and then reworking it. That very rarely happened. At each stage, you could more or less gauge what was going to happen next. Then the painting is turned over. It's burnished with an agate stone. And what that basically does is that it basically, the colors which are mineral-based, they sort of line up molecularly. In other words, basically when a color is placed in a palette, the atoms are moving around. They're bouncing. When you heat something and burnish it, it actually lines up. And it actually becomes more reflective. When it comes before more reflective and shiny, it gives off light as well as absorbing more light. So you've got a glass-like surface which emulates fresco, which is where the tradition kind of came from to some extent. And then on top of that, you can do a very fine line with the miniature um, of inclines and then washes to get the subtlety of color. And then that's called protage. In other words, the bit where you can turn flat two dimensions into modality and actually you can describe things more. So it's a very set process. There are five, five parts of the actual process beginning to end. And as Glenn was saying, the guy who did the original drawing would have been the master. Then it's given off to the guy who makes the actual color painting. Then it's given off to the guy who's done the actual lining work. Then it's given off to another guy who burnishes. Then somebody else will then do all the background work starting from the outside of the image working inward. The face is normally painted last because it's the most difficult. At that point, if we look at a, a typical scene, border, background painting, architecture, figure, that goes through the atelier, and at the very end, it goes back to the master, and then he would do the fine lining for the, for the face. That's generally how it would have worked. Professor Goswami, you have that lovely picture that appears in, 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 in your work every so often of Nain Suk standing behind Rajabal Wan Singh. Uh, it's slightly crouching down in a slightly subservient position while the Raja in his magnificent coat is admiring the miniature that's just been delivered to him from the workshop. Yeah, yeah. that particular painting is a kind of an iconic work because we see a patron and a painter together. And the painter is occupying a very lowly position, standing behind folded hands, bent back and so on. And the ruler is seated like this, looking at the painting. And I'm quite sure Nensuk is constantly watching how much Balwan Singh, his patron, is able to see in this particular painting which I have presented to him. Now, it's an interesting thing. We have an expression called Chashme Haira, <coughs> a Persian expression, which means the wondering eye, the eye that constantly keeps wondering. And the patron or the person who's looking at the work of art is intended to wonder, to have a feeling of ismail in his, in his mind. Is, did I see that earlier or did I not see it earlier? Is the thatch of hair a black sort of a flat uh, patch of color? Or is, has every single hair been singly painted or something like this? And 
know, as far as I am concerned, this is a quality um, which we associate with connoisseurship. And inevitably, a, a couplet of the great poet Fez comes to my mind when I look at these paintings. You know, he says in one of his ghazals, Kai bar iski khatir zarre zarre ka jigar chira magar ye chashme haira jiski hairani nahi jati. I took an atom and sliced it again and again and yet again. <coughs> and this wandering of eye of mine does not stop wondering, is there more to see? Is there something else to it and so on? So this, the feeding of the feeling of a sense of wonder is something which a miniature very often succeeds. Deborah, at um, the same time, a little bit after Nine Sook is, is producing his work in the hills, your amazing guys are at work in Jodhpur. Uh, producing the, 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 can we see some pictures? We have, at long last, some images having made you sit through us talking. Do we have the PowerPoint? So. Give us, while it's waiting to come on, give us a little bit of the background to the, um, uh, the job pool pictures. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm technology moment there. Um, one of the extraordinary things that happens in the Jodhpur court in the 18th century is that there's a shift in scale from paintings that are handheld to pages in unbound manuscripts that are coffee table sized, about four feet across. And the technique and the, the technique and the detail of smaller miniature paintings is retained but the scale becomes so large that you can no longer hold the painting in your own hands to look at it. So this is an example of one of the monumental manuscripts uh, that comes out of Jodhpur in the second half of the 18th century. The first large manuscripts that are made are all on Vaishnava Bhakti themes. They're patronized by a ruler, Maharaja Vijay Singh, who's a, who's a great devotee of Krishna. And so, even though we don't have any court records about exactly why he made the shift, why his artist did it, we think it comes in, in that context of a kind of devotionalism when Krishna is living on earth. It's a sort of Vallabh Sampradaya, immerse yourself in the land of Braj, um, listen to the, you know, listen to the words of the Bhagavad Purana, you will get some, you know, moksha from doing that. And so this is the creation of, of a new art form that adheres to the format of, of, a, of a Rajput unbound Hindu manuscript, but just is, is blown up. So I just show you some, if I can advance this. What should we be pointing at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pointing to Krishna. Who's, who's the technical here? What do we he use? What am I not pointing to? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, just so you see that this is a detail. This is a detail from the painting, so you can see the same technique, the same mineral colors. And the earliest manuscript looks like this. But when, okay, okay, I'll just stop here. Um, when the artists move to their second manuscript, this is a Ramcharit Manas, also monumental size with 90, some 90 folios. You can see the artists beginning to experiment with, okay, I've got it this large, what can I do with scale? And so we have this very fractured composition, Ram on one side on one mountain, face off with the demon Ravan, all the way on the right. This is an extraordinary, um, that's the, the ocean between Lanka and India. And you have this artist creating the solution of how do I put this all on a page? This is a wonderful example of why Jodhpur painting was considered quite awful um, within the scale of Indian painting connoisseurship uh, until very recently, until Garden and Cosmos, because this was considered an artist who who couldn't get it all on the page right. 
<laughs> but with, uh, with our sensibility today, we can say, oh, that monumental manuscript format became a great space of creativity and new forms of expression. So it's not that I um, am trying to argue against the great importance of the Minya tradition, or in fact, there is an extraordinary value placed on the very tiny. Just looking at what artists can do when they get that larger page. Is that called steroids? <laughs> We've got um, only a few. Uh, do you, have you got one more to show? Yeah. I'll show you one more. Uh, great. Um, early 19th century, different Maharaja, his name is Man Singh, grows up in that Vaishnava Bhakti context of devotion to Krishna, makes a radical shift, follows a, a Nath Mahasiddha from a Hatha Yoga tradition, so all of the manuscripts change. The Nath tradition is Nirgun. It's a formless deity, if there's any. So we have artists making hundreds of folios for concepts that never entered the visual culture of India. So for example, in this large folio on the left, that field of solid gold is the Nirgun Praman. It's the absolute, evolving into Prakriti and Purush. So you see artists working with scale, they're very shiny, you can't see them at all. You have to go to Jodhpur, they're up on the walls right now. Good see them. i show you one more. Ah. <laughs> the absolute emerging into form. Two last questions, one, one to Professor Goswami, one to Desmond. Very briefly, you touched on, when we were talking about Nine Silk in a subservient position to the Raja, just say something about the social status of these artists. These were not grand figures, were they? They were, um, in most cases, regarded on the level of craftsmen or, or, or palace musicians. Uh, uh, the social situation of the position of the artist was, in one word, pitiable. For all the titles that they earned, Nadirul Mulk, Nadirul Zama, <coughs> when it comes to reality, I mean, Look at the portrait of Keshav Das, one of the greatest painters at the Akbari court. As Here's this man. man standing, bent back, aged, holding a petition in his hand, written in Devanagari, which he wishes to present to the Emperor Akbar. And he's not even allowed to approach the Emperor. There's an Akhtar Begi standing with a stick in his hand, showing him off, go away. And in the petition it is written something like, this money that I'm receiving or whatever I'm receiving is not enough. Right? There is a letter written by a painter called Shibba from the Pahadi area that I had occasion to land upon and I published, in which the painter is writing to one of the great patrons of painting in the Pahadi area, Maharaja Sansarchan. And what does he say after the usual address, Sri Maharaja Diraj, so on, so on, so forth, that please allow me to leave because the superintendent whom you placed above me just shows me his thumb. Nothing. I, I, you won't get anything for this kind of work. And I'm, I'm on the point of starving, so please allow me to leave, or something like that. Now the situation, therefore, is really pathetic. Right in the middle of the 19th century, all that the painters were receiving in terms of cash payments was pachas paise, aathana, half a rupee per day. That's about it. And ev everyone of that particular level, I mean, received the same amount of money. Just to bring it up to today now, um, my impression, perhaps quite wrongly, is that with the arrival of photography and the replacement of um, the miniature tradition with, with photography, miniature painting survives in India really only as a tourist art. But that it seems to me that in modern Pakistan that you've had a remarkable revival which hasn't so far taken place here in India. We're still being chased and beaten by sticks, so that, that really hasn't changed a great deal. Um, yeah, there is a revival of the craft in Pakistan, and that was largely because of the policy of the Pakistani government when they set up the National College Lahore, and the policy was that every student who passed through the school would have to learn miniature painting in its first year. Then they would go on to then practice other crafts, be it going to uh, painting or sculpture or whatever. Uh, they were given a kind of a grounding, and also the tutors at the school were miniaturists themselves. Um, in India, there was a slight different change to that, because we had two main schools. One was Shanti Nikitan, which is in Bengal, and the other one was Baroda in Gujarat. Shanti Nikitan took the same path as what you'd find um, 
it, obviously it was, it was instigated by Tagore and the Tagore family. And the whole idea was to look at art as one part of a wi wider landscape which involved music and poetry and many different crafts. In Baroda, they took more a tradition looking towards a contemporary. So miniature would come and work there, but it wasn't really a, a very specific part of the tradition or a part of the actual curriculum. So in some ways, Pakistan kind of moved forward. Whereas in, in Baroda, it was more of a critical view of what miniature paintings were. What's happened now is that in Pakistan, there's been a flowering in recent times of traditional miniature painting. It's fairly limited because there's not much of the critical faculty, which is kind of happening here with contemporary art. And the point being that it's not that one died out. Most contemporary practitioners today, myself included, draw from miniature painting. It is vitally their, their first and foremost inspiration. It largely is the backbone of what happens here. We've got, I think, about three minutes, so maybe just a couple of questions. This lady's oh, this chap's hand is straight up. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask that, uh, do you think uh, during the time of Aurangzeb, the miniature art form has suffered? Second part would be, do you think that there are no more new subjects available because we haven't moved on from dancing girls, gods and animals, and there are no new forms uh, in miniature art? So do you think there is a future in this uh, category? Thank you. Professor Goswami, do you want to answer the question about Aurangzeb? Uh, you do the Aurangzeb bit and I'll do the, okay. the other bit. Or Aurangzeb. Did, did miniature painting die out under Aurangzeb? Did, it, did miniature painting get crushed by Aurangzeb? Did he destroy the atelier? No, no, I mean, I don't think that is the case. Uh, Aurangzeb had sort of some deleterious effect on the growth of Mughal painting, but not really. It survived everywhere else, survived in Rajasthan, survived in the Pahadi area, and flourished, actually flourished. So I think there's some myths that the coming of Aurangzeb, everything started dying out and so on. I don't think that was the case at all. And Desmond, the second half? And on, on that note, it's, no, I agree with what you're saying to some extent, yes. You, you, you look like very disgruntled and I can understand that fully. Like many of us, it's time we stop painting dancing girls. But what you've got to remember is that traditions carry on in many multifaceted. Artists can pick up for them and do work about them, but it doesn't mean to say that you're going to make a miniature painting. You can relate most of the good art that's been done in the last 20 years in this country has some kind of miniature base. At the same time, people work with them directly. I happen to be one of them. Neela Mashaik's work is direct. Ghulam Mohammed Sheikh was sitting in the back there somewhere. Uh, what he doesn't know about miniature painting isn't worth knowing. All of these people draw from that tradition of painting. Um, what tends to happen at the same time, traditions wax and wane. There are those that follow and they will flower at a different stage and there are those that get inspired by it. At the moment, it's a bit of both. In Rajasthan, you can find the dancing girls, but you can also find Mahavir Swami working in Bikini who does wonderful paintings of Indian cricket stars. Manish Soni in Bilwaru who does incredible work. You can go to Lalit Sharma and his son in Udaipur. He does digital pitch wise. So actually the landscape is a lot more broader than we would think. It just hasn't had as much exposure as it has in Pakistan. One last question. Well, uh, whenever we talk of uh, miniature paintings, we tend to go to Persia and all those Ra Radha Krishna paintings only. What about uh, comics like Tintin, then Asterix, and all those uh, small paintings, they are in, uh, uh, to tell a story. All these paintings, they, they are w one painting, and they tell so many st stories. But the small ones in a book, book form, like graphic novel, or uh, travelogue, or something like that. What do you call them? I, I think, if I understood your correction, your, your question correctly, you were asking about uh, the relationship of uh, miniature paintings to something like the graphic novel today. I, I think there's a very close relationship, actually. I yeah. think that uh, what certainly under the Mogul court was true is that you had uh, a, a rich tradition of illustrating manuscripts and that those illustrations operated on at least two levels. One was specifically tied to the text, 
uh, and they endeavored to make visual some moment uh, that uh, had been chosen from that text, but they also operated quasi, if not entirely independently of that text, as visual images, like a graphic novel that could be read entirely on their own, even if you couldn't read the Farsi in which the text was written. Uh, and in that way, I think the most successful ones, like uh, the images of a graphic novel, had this ability, it's what I mentioned earlier, to operate almost in a cinematic fashion, one after the other, telling a story in that very personal space that Desmond was talking about, but in a very exciting way. Thank you very, very much. Um, Desmond Desaru, Professor Goswami, Ben Lowry, Deborah Diamond, thank you so much. And we're, and, and William Dalrymple. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.